Good evening, and welcome to BMT InfoNet's webinar, Acute Myelogenous Leukemia, Current Treatment Options, and Promising Research. My name is Sue Stewart, and I'll be your host for this evening. I'd also like to thank Astellas Pharma for generously supporting this webinar. So without further uh, ado, I'd like to begin by welcoming Mary Beth Percival. Dr. Percival is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology at the University of Washington. She is also an assistant member in the Clinical Research Division at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Her practice focuses on patients with AML and myelodysplastic syndrome, both in the inpatient and the outpatient setting. <clears throat> Dr. Percival is involved in the development and execution of clinical trials for AML patients, as well as in epidemiology research to help determine and improve the factors that affect survival and outcomes for AML patients. Dr. Percival completed her fellowship in hematology oncology at Stanford, working specifically on early phase clinical trials in acute myeloid leukemia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Percival. Thanks, Sue. I appreciate the introduction. Um, so here's just the title slide, but we'll jump right in. I think you guys all have a good introduction. Here's the outline of the talk. Um, first, we'll describe a little bit about what AML actually is, then move on to treatment options, a little bit about who should consider allogeneic transplant and what other therapies besides transplant are available, and then end with a little bit about promising research and questions that you as a patient or family member should ask your doctor. So acute myeloid leukemia is a cancer of the blood and bone marrow. The malignant cells in AML are known as blasts, which are very early cells that are found in the bone marrow that normally are able to grow and differentiate into a variety of different cells that come out into the peripheral blood. Unfortunately, there is an arrest in the maturation of the cells, the blast that happens in AML due to a variety of different mutations that can happen. One common question that patients have is what stage they have when they're diagnosed with AML, and there is no staging for AML, unlike for solid organ cancers, where staging is very important in determining prognosis. The blood and marrow compartment are basically continuous throughout the body, so staging doesn't, doesn't really come into play for AML. The other issue I wanted to bring up is um, patients often ask when the AML started. We will never know without doing serial bone marrow biopsies, which is clearly not a realistic uh, circumstance for a healthy person, let alone, uh, let alone one who has actually been diagnosed with AML. But in general, the term acute is probably quite relevant, and the patients were only very recently starting to have symptoms when they're diagnosed with AML. So it probably hasn't actually been around for that long. Um, there can also sometimes be, it's often called a liquid tumor, but you can have solid masses of leukemia cells, which are called chloromas or granulocytic sarcomas as well. But that happens in well less than 10% of people, either at the time of diagnosis or relapse. Here's just a quick picture of a bone marrow of a patient with AML. The large cells um, with the lighter purple uh, nucleus in them are the blasts or the leukemia cells, and then there are some more normal cells maturing around it. Blasts should normally make up well less than 5% of the cells in the bone marrow, so you can see that there are far more in this patient than would be expected. Another question that patients often ask is who actually gets AML? Um, so it's not a common disease. The number of new cases estimated in 2017 by the National Cancer Institute was going to be 21,380. Final data isn't available from last year yet. The rate has been increasing by about 3.1% per year 
that's primarily related to our aging Medicare population because the disease does increase in incidence as patients get older. The five-year survival rate is only about 27% right now. It's certainly higher in some subgroups than it is in others. And it's notable that it's been improving over time, but the survival rate in 1975 when the group of the NCI began collecting data was only 6%. So clearly, even though it's improved to 27%, there's still a lot of room for improvement. The median age at diagnosis is about age 68, and I'll show you a graph on the next slide that describes how the incidence increases with age. AML can be cured in many patients, and that's something that we'll talk a little bit more about later as we start to delve into treatment options. AML can also be related to other myeloid disorders, such as myelodysplastic syndrome or myeloproliferative neoplasms. In this sort of situation, it's called a secondary AML. And it can also be related to prior exposure to chemotherapy or radiation therapy which has often been administered for a prior cancer. This is called therapy-related AML. So you can see the incidence by age. Um, the AML is quite uncommon in younger patients. On the x-axis, you can see age, and on the y-axis, the incidence per 100,000 patients. The median age, as I mentioned previously, is age 68 which means that half the patients are younger than 68 when they're diagnosed and half the patients are older. In terms of types of AML, I want to spend just a minute talking about APL or acute promyelocytic leukemia and then we'll talk a little bit about the risk stratification for the other kinds of acute myeloid leukemia. APL is sometimes referred to as the subtype M3 based on an older classification system. But at this point, it is essentially a different disease than all other kinds of AML. It used to be fatal in most patients because of a high incidence of complications related to bleeding and clotting at the time of diagnosis but it's now treated in the majority of patients without any chemotherapy at all. Here's a survival graph that shows the outcomes of patients who are treated for acute promyelocytic APL with a combination of what's affectionately called a vitamin, ATRA, which is a vitamin A derivative, and a mineral arsenic trioxide, or ATO. So the blue line in the curve represents the survival for patients who were treated with a combination of ATRA and arsenic alone. And you can see um, time on the x-axis up to seven years, and their probability of survival is very close to 100%. It's about 98% in this study. That's even better than was seen in the control arm shown in yellow, which was a combination of ATRA, all transretinoic acid, and chemotherapy. So this study was really what made it so that we could safely treat patients with um, what I call the vitamin and mineral ATRA and arsenic trioxide. At the time of diagnosis, for the other kinds of AML, sometimes called non-APL AML, but here we'll just say AML, leukemia physicians work to risk stratify patients, meaning that they take into account characteristics of both the disease and of the patient to help figure out the best path forward. The first testing that gets done is cytogenetics and molecular testing which can be done on blasts either from the blood, if there are enough of them there, or from a bone marrow biopsy at the time of diagnosis. Together, these genetic characteristics can help determine the likelihood that a patient will get into a complete remission, and will also help make determinations about future treatment options, including whether the patient will receive chemotherapy alone, 
or chemotherapy followed by a transplant. The main guidelines which are used for genetic risk stratification, which incorporate both cytogenetics and molecular testing, are the 2017 European Leukemia Net, or ELN, guidelines. Other factors that are very important for risk stratification are whether the, the AML is considered to be primary or de novo versus whether it falls into the previous categories I mentioned of being secondary, i.e. related to a prior hematologic disorder, most commonly myelodysplastic syndrome or a myeloproliferative neoplasm, or whether the leukemia is therapy-related, related to a prior exposure to chemotherapy or radiation. Another really important point is the functional status of the patient themselves. As we discussed previously, acute myeloid leukemia often has a very acute onset with patients being able to point to a specific day within the past few weeks when they all of a sudden started to feel quite poorly. That um, may lead to quite a significant decline in the functional status of a patient where if they have an infection or some other complication, they need a transfusion of red blood cells, they may be quickly laid low by this. And so it's important when thinking about the functional status of a patient to try to tease out how much of it is related to underlying comorbidities that are not related to the leukemia and how much are actually related to the acute myeloid leukemia and could therefore be expected to turn around relatively quickly after the initiation of chemotherapy. Here's the most common treatment schema for a patient with AML. Once the diagnosis is made, and usually it can be made relatively quickly, the treating physician needs to determine whether the patient falls into a category of being fit or less fit. We'll talk about less fit patients first. It's a little bit easier. In general, patients like that should be treated with a clinical trial if there is one available versus supportive care. Sometimes less intensive chemotherapies, such as hypomethylating agents, are also used for patients who are less fit. However, many patients, probably most patients, fall into the category of being fit at the time of diagnosis, and they generally receive what's called induction chemotherapy. We'll talk more about different types of induction chemotherapy on the next slide. Then, while we're waiting for the blood counts to recover after induction chemotherapy, the treating physician can use different factors to help determine what this following treatment should be like. In particular, they use the risk stratification based on genetic factors, including the cytogenetics and molecular testing, which sometimes take a week or two to come back after they're sent on the blast from the bone marrow or from the peripheral blood. They also look into availability of a donor for an allogeneic transplant. And then after the patient's blood counts recover following chemotherapy, they will examine the status of the marrow to see if there's any evidence of MRD or what's called measurable residual disease. Then the decision will be made about whether the patient should receive consolidation chemotherapy or an allogeneic transplant or frequently a combination of both depending on factors such as timing and identification of a donor. If patients have good risk disease, some favorable cytogenetic or molecular abnormalities, that suggests that they would be more likely to respond to chemotherapy alone and have a good chance of being cured. Patients who have adverse risk cytogenetics or molecular findings would not be expected to be cured with chemotherapy alone and generally are recommended for an allogeneic transplant. Patients in the intermediate category, we generally recommend an allogeneic transplant for as well. Sometimes consolidation chemotherapy can also be called post-remission therapy. And I think it's important to say that generally for AML, unlike for 
The other acute leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, or ALL, there's no role for maintenance therapy outside one particular clinical situation that we will discuss right now. I think one other thing to say is that fitness is somewhat of a complicated concept to describe, even though, as you can see from this treatment schema, it really underlies a lot of the decision making. There are a lot of different factors that play into it. One algorithm that we use in Seattle that was identified um, in a retrospective analysis of several thousand patients treated on clinical trials through SWOG as well as at MD Anderson Cancer Center is the treatment-related mortality score that Dr. Roland Walter developed. And it uses a number of different clinical factors in addition to age. The goal is to balance the chronologic age with the perhaps more important biologic age of a patient and thereby determine what treatment options are available. It's also important to say that there's no absolute cutoff for the upper age at which a transplant should be considered. Generally, allogeneic transplant is less common in patients over the age of 70 but frequently um, that number is getting pushed up higher with um, the advent of more non-myeloblative conditioning regimens. Induction chemotherapy involves generally a combination of several different kinds of chemotherapy drugs that act synergistically. After that chemotherapy is administered, which is generally over about a week and generally in the hospital. There's a long period of waiting for the blood counts to recover, which usually takes between three and four weeks and sometimes even longer than that. During that time, patients are quite susceptible to infections and are often treated with prophylactic antimicrobials, including antibiotics, antifungals, and antivirals. At the time of count recovery, a remission bone marrow biopsy is performed to help determine if a patient has achieved a complete remission the way we hope that they have. The most common induction chemotherapy is a regimen that's been around since it was initially published in 1973 called 7 plus 3, which consists of seven days of continuous dosed infusional cytarabine at a low dose, as well as three days of an anthracycline, most commonly donorubicin. In Seattle, we often use high-dose cytarabine-based regimens. One is called Flagida, another is called G-Clam. There are any number of other combinations that are reasonable to use for induction. I think it's important to note here that the NCCN or the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which has great guidelines available for physicians. Their AML guidelines, I wouldn't say for patients, they don't have as much information for AML as they do for some other kinds of cancers, but it is still a good website that has a lot of evidence um, around to check out. The NCCN says that the best management of any cancer patient is in a clinical trial, and I think that's important for patients to think about as they are starting to think about treatment and where they want to be treated. This stratification with the arrows applies to whether, applies whether somebody is receiving induction chemotherapy for newly diagnosed leukemia or whether they are being reinduced if their leukemia has relapsed meaning that it was in a remission and then came back at some later time point. I should also note that day 14 marrows are sometimes performed kind of between the induction chemotherapy and that time of count recovery, but more and more people are not, physicians are not performing day 14 marrows because it frequently does not actually change management. And the findings at day 14 are not always those uh, that are at day 28, meaning that somebody may have evidence of blast, the leukemia cells at day 14 that may actually disappear by day 28, or conversely, they may not have any leukemia cells that are evident at day 14, and they may still end up being 
in a refractory disease situation at day 28. So what kind of response are we hoping for? The best response after treatment that we hope for is a complete remission or a CR. That requires that patients have less than 5% blasts in the bone marrow, as well as evidence of count recovery with a neutrophil count in the peripheral blood over 1,000 per microliter and a platelet count over um, 100,000. We also um, classify patients the CR that patients achieve um, based on their count recovery. So if they have less than 5% blast, but they haven't met one of those guidelines about neutrophils or platelets in the peripheral blood, then we say that they've achieved a complete remission with incomplete count recovery or a CRI. Another thing we look for is evidence of MRD, which I mentioned before is measurable residual disease. So as we have very sensitive tests for some certain patients' types of leukemia using laser-based antibody tests such as flow cytometry or looking for very particular cytogenetic or molecular abnormalities that a patient, an individual patient's leukemia has, we can detect a very, very small amount of leukemia. And so we might say that somebody is in a CR with MRD, meaning that they're in a complete remission, but they still have some evidence of measurable residual disease. Ideally, we wouldn't be able to detect any. Another potential response would be if a patient has either refractory or progressive disease after induction, meaning that they still have 5% uh, blasts or more, and then I mentioned the category of relapse, meaning that patients have gotten into a remission, but um, they then, for a period of months or years, um, but then their disease comes back, and that's considered to be a relapse. 2017 was a really big year for AML. We had been leaning on some of the old standard chemotherapies, such as 7 plus 3, for a long time. But last year, there were four drugs that were actually approved for the treatment of AML, which is more than the past 20 years. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about these recently approved drugs. I think we're still trying to figure out exactly how we are going to uh, use them in clinical practice, but they do have indications that have been approved by the FDA. Um, so the first drug is called Midastorin or Ridapt. The second one is called Enacidinib or Adhifa. Both of these first two are specific um, inhibitors that are only indicated for subtypes of AML. The third one is CPX351. It goes by the brand name Vixios. Um, this drug is a, a special formulation of the older drugs that are found in the 7 plus 3 induction chemotherapy combination that I mentioned. And then the fourth drug is gemtuzumab alzogamycin, which is also called Mylotarg. Mylotarg has kind of an interesting history for um, those of you who have um, known about leukemia for a while. It was approved in 2000 and then voluntarily taken off the market. It had an accelerated approval. Um, and then was voluntarily taken off the market in 2010, but then based on a preponderance of data has come back. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time at the end of the talk discussing drugs that um, are in active clinical trials and under um, a lot of clinical investigation. One of those is venetoclax, venclexta, or ABT199, which is actually approved for a different kind of leukemia, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia and is often used in uh, a number of other lymphomas and in multiple myeloma as well. And there's quite promising data um, with that, so it, it kind of gets an honorable mention since it, it has uh, been fast-tracked by the FDA and, and may be approved for the treatment of AML at some point in the near future. Uh, Mitostorin is the first of the drugs that I'm going to discuss. It's an oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And it's been most studied in patients with newly diagnosed AML, 
um, and that's the category of patients that the FDA approval was in. Patients have to have a mutation in a gene called SLT3, which is uh, responsible for um, the uh, controlling, normally controlling um, some of the, the proliferation of cells in the bone marrow. So when this protein is abnormally activated by a mutation, it leads to uncontrolled growth. Patients with AML um, that has a FLT3 mutation often have a very high white blood cell count when they're diagnosed. FLT3 mutations are seen in about 25 to 30 percent of patients regardless of their age, and based on the amount of uh, the cells that carry a FLT3 mutation, Using those 2017 European Leukemia Net guidelines, we can divide those, those patients generally get divided into the intermediate or adverse risk group. So it's you know I, the, of paramount importance to try to come up with treatments. So this is a, a curve that shows survival for patients um, who have newly diagnosed AML, who then received this SLT3 inhibitor, mitostorin, and who had SLT3 positive AML. So on the x-axis, you can see the time in months. On the y-axis, you can see survival with 100% at the top. And the blue line demonstrates what happens for the outcome of patients who received induction chemotherapy with 7 plus 3, and then mitostorin was added in as well. The study was a randomized phase three placebo-controlled arm, so you can see in the red line the outcomes of patients who received standard induction chemotherapy with 7 plus 3, but instead of receiving the mitostorin pill, they received a placebo instead. And so overall, these findings were very significant and led to the approval of mitostorin because the overall survival benefit was about 10% higher in the patients who received mitostorin compared to those who received placebo. This drug was only approved in April of 2017, so it hasn't even been around on the market for a year. There are a lot of ongoing questions about how mitostorin is going to fit in. There's a question about whether there's a benefit in non-FLT3 mutated AML. It's a kinase inhibitor for a lot of other kinases besides just the FLT3 kinase. And so there are some studies ongoing, including one planned by the cooperative group SWOG in older patients to examine whether mitostorin is beneficial in patients who don't have FLT3 mutations. Another question is whether the mitostorin tyrosine kinase inhibitor will be effective for maintenance after allogeneic transplant. That's really not yet clear. Um, this drug was studied in patients uh, in the study that I mentioned previously on the previous slide. This drug was studied um, for maintenance for a year after um, the completion of chemotherapy. But patients who went to transplant did not receive that maintenance, and so it's unclear whether um, that's going to be a, another role for this drug. And then I should also mention that there are a lot of second-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are under active clinical investigation. Probably the most exciting of those is gilteritinib because it's well-tolerated and because it's been studied in patients who have previously been exposed to mitostorin and may have failed mitostorin for some reason, either because they are relapsed or refractory to the drug or um, because they weren't able to tolerate the drug. There are some other ones, including quizartinib and quinolinib, and so it'll be interesting to see in some of the studies that are ongoing right now whether these second-generation drugs are better, they're certainly more potent and more selective, but does, does that mean that they're going to be more effective against the treatment of FLT3 positive AML? Enacidinib um, was approved in about uh, August of 2017. It's another oral inhibitor, um, but unlike mitostorin, it has only been studied as a single agent and not in combination. 
It's approved only for patients who have relapsed or refractory IDH2 mutated AML. IDH2 mutations occur in about 10% of patients with AML, so it's not particularly common, and it is not always checked at the time of diagnosis or relapse. It's not uh, standard on a lot of the molecular panels that are used for patients, so the doctor who's treating the patient needs to have a high index of clinical suspicion to say, I think this might be an IDH mutated AML and I should see if this patient has uh, the, the mutation and would benefit from receiving this oral drug. Uh, there's also mutations that can be found in IDH1, and there's another inhibitor that's being developed called ivocidinib. We'll see where that ends up, um, but that is also found. Those IDH1 mutations are found in about 5 or 10 percent of patients. There are a number of ongoing questions with enosidinib. Um, one of them, and I think the, the most important, um, is again, is it safe and is it effective to combine um, these, these oral inhibitors like enosidinib or its cousin ivocidinib with chemotherapy, whether that's less intensive treatment like hypomethylating agents or whether that's more intensive treatment like induction chemotherapy. Vixios or CPX351 is a liposomal formulation of cytarabine and donorubicin. It's approved for the treatment of therapy-related AML and AML with myelodysplasia-related changes, newly diagnosed patients only. Because it uses old drugs that are combined in a new way with this liposomal formulation, it seems like it shouldn't necessarily be that much more effective. It does have um, a longer half-life and sticks around for longer. So maybe it's um, able to deliver the drugs with a little bit less toxicity. Again, like some of the other drugs, this hasn't been studied in combination yet, and it also hasn't been studied in the salvage setting, i.e. in patients who have relapsed, only really in newly diagnosed patients. So those are future questions for how CPX is going to have a role. The final drug that received approval from the FDA in 2017 is gemtuzumab azogamycin, or GO, also called Mylotarg. And it's an antibody drug conjugate, kind of a, a, the first entrant into a class of drugs that target a specific marker that's found on the surface of leukemia cells, in this case, CD33. And that antibody is conjugated or attached to a very potent chemotherapy. So the idea is that the, this molecule is able to find a leukemia cell and deliver the chemotherapy payload directly to the leukemia cell. It's approved for both newly diagnosed and relapsed refractory patients. The strongest benefit is found in favorable risk patients. I then want to move on to allogeneic transplant, which is a really important component of the treatment regimen for a lot of patients with AML. Allo um, comes from the Latin meaning other, and so allogeneic transplants, HCT stands for hematopoietic cell transplants. Allo transplants are transplants from other people, so unlike an autologous transplant, which is done um, from a patient's own cells, with rare exceptions, um, autologous transplants are not generally used for patients with AML. There are two goals from an allogeneic transplant. For any patient, the goal is to get a new immune system from the donor, and ideally to get a graft versus leukemia effect, i.e., the donor cells will attack any residual leukemia cells. Some patients, generally younger patients, 60 and under, will receive myeloablative transplants, which have very intensive conditioning regimens that will completely wipe out any remaining um, cells, whether good or bad, in the host. And so hopefully that conditioning can wipe out any leukemia cells as well. 
There are multiple sources of stem cells that can be used, and they're divided into two categories. One is the anatomic source, and then one is based on the relationship between donor and recipient. So there are different ways of looking at the cells. And this is why instead of saying bone marrow transplant, BMT often stands for blood and marrow transplant, or perhaps more accurately, we should use HCT, the hematopoietic cell transplant designation. The anatomic source can be from the marrow. That's only done in 5 to 10 percent of transplants these days. Then more commonly, it's peripheral blood, which is probably 85% of transplants, and about 5% of transplants use umbilical cord blood that's been frozen and placed into a registry. It's also important to categorize the relationship between the donor and recipient. We talked about autologous transplants, which are not generally used for AML, and then allogeneic transplants, so whether it's a related full match, i.e., a sibling, um, or a related partial match, which would be generally a half-matched transplant or a haploidentical transplant. Another option is to have a completely unrelated donor, generally somebody who is matched. Here is um, an example when we're talking about that you have a 25% chance of having a sibling be a match to you. This is just an example of the genetic information and how it's passed down from each of the parents. You can see the father and the mother on the top and then the six siblings. So for example, sibling one and sibling two inherited the same copies of the two um, chromosomes that are listed there, the A and the C chromosome, and so they have the blue and green and are I, I, HLA identical. Um, they share similarities with the other siblings, except for example, sibling one and sibling five don't share any common um, alleles at all, so they then have fall into that category of a 25% chance of not being any match at all. The probability of finding a donor is listed here for both um, siblings and for unrelated donors. A matched sibling is about a 25 to 30% chance. A one antigen mismatched related donor is very uncommon. That's about a 3% chance. But generally, the chance of finding an unrelated donor is very dependent on what your ethnic background is. There was a big article in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago that parsed it out into much finer detail than I have on this slide, which just talks about patients who fall into the general categories of being Caucasian, Hispanic, or black. To find an unrelated donor that's an 8 out of 8 match, i.e., a very good matched unrelated donor, it's about a 70% chance for a patient of Caucasian background, but only about an 18% chance for somebody who has an African American background. And this is related to a couple of factors. One is um, the representation in the registry, there aren't as many African Americans um, proportionally as there are Caucasians who are in the unrelated donor registry. It also is related to the fact that some of the alleles um, that we have looked at, as you could have seen on the previous slide looking at the HLA study for a particular family, some of the alleles for the African American patients are very uncommon. In contrast, however, now we use these unrelated, excuse me, these um, alternative donor transplants with umbilical cord blood or a haploidentical donor who would be a half match, who could be um, any parent or any child of a patient, as well as some of their siblings for a haploidentical donor. And you can see that the chance is 90 to over 95% for any of the ethnic backgrounds that we would be able to find a donor who met those categories. So when should allo transplant be considered? For most patients um, with AML who have an intermediate or adverse risk disease based on their cytogenetic and molecular categories, 
in their first complete remission or after their first relapse. Um, generally, we think at that point that AML cannot be cured with chemotherapy alone and that patients should undergo a transplant at that point. And then listed there are indications for ALL or myelodysplastic syndrome. This um, study demonstrated why we recommend that patients undergo an allo transplant in their first remission if they fall into the intermediate or poor risk category of their cytogenetics. This is a combination meta-analysis of 23 randomized trials and 5,800 patients. And you can see that that little diamond for the overall demonstrates that the, the the likelihood of survival is better by being on the left side of that line, but the effect is even more pronounced in patients who have poor risk disease, as you can see in the bottom diamond. There are a lot of risks of transplant. So infection is a really big issue. This is not really within the scope of the talk to talk more than is on this slide. But relapse is another big issue that we can't always control against, even when people have been through so very much to get to the point of getting uh, to the transplant in the first place. And then graft versus host disease. We talked about the good counterpart to that that we'd like to see a lot of, which is the graft versus leukemia effect. But sometimes the donor cells get confused and attack the host um, or the patient as well. I think there are a number of areas for future research in AML where we, despite all of these new drugs that I mentioned to you that were approved by the FDA in 2017, areas that we really need to try to come up with new strategies for patients. Anytime a patient relapses or has refractory disease, that's a very challenging situation. We need to have new drugs that can help patients achieve remission and help bridge them to an allogeneic transplant. We talked briefly about the situation of MRD, or measurable residual disease, which is a very challenging clinical scenario because patients who have some element of detectable disease are more likely to relapse whether they receive chemotherapy alone or transplant, but we don't know what the best treatments are in terms of being able to eradicate the residual disease. Patients with adverse risk disease, I showed you on the previous slide, are more likely to benefit from transplant, but we need to try to come up with better strategies to be able to get them into remission so that they can undergo transplant. I put unfit in quotes because Sometimes clinical trials call patients unfit who maybe are not totally unfit and could benefit from more intensive therapy, but this is a very challenging um, category of patients to treat. There are a lot of non-transplant cellular therapies like CAR T cells, which are starting to come to the, the forefront in other diseases such as lymphomas and ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, they're not exactly ready for prime time in AML yet, but I think there's a lot of work to be done. Clinicaltrials.gov has a lot of, at every clinical trial that's going on in the US and most of the ones going on in the world. So it's a great place to sort of look through. They have filters to um, within a certain number of miles of a zip code and, and to be very specific with some of the search terms to be able to identify um, what might be available in terms of trials. There are a lot of drugs that are under investigation. If you go look on clinicaltrials.gov, you would determine that quite quickly. Um, but here are a couple that I think actually have a, a good chance of being approved for the treatment of AML. One of them is this drug called venetoclax, the BCL2 inhibitor, which is approved for the treatment of CLL and is used in a number of other hematologic diseases and has had very promising responses when combined with azacitidine or decitabine or low-dose cytarabine in patients with um, newly diagnosed AML who are generally considered not fit for induction chemotherapy. Giltaritinib, I mentioned, is probably the most promising of these second-generation tyrosine kinase inhibitors that are active against FLT3. 
and it has the added benefit of being quite tolerable to patients, which I think is obviously a really important, huge benefit because it doesn't matter how great a drug is if it can't be tolerated by the patient. I think um, it, it's in a lot of phase three studies in a variety of different settings right now, including one study uh, for maintenance after allogeneic transplant, but it's really too soon to say how gilteritinib is going to fit in and into the landscape of treatment options that we have for AML patients and even actually whether it's going to get approved because it has not yet been approved by the FDA, though it has been fast-tracked in, in the way that venetoclax has. Ivocidinib, I mentioned briefly before, is kind of the cousin drug to enosidinib, which is being studied in patients with IDH1 mutations. Again, that's quite a limited subset of AML patients, so it remains to be seen how that drug is going to be developed. There are a number of targeted antibody treatments that um, try to fill the space um, that uh, mylotar, gemtuzumab, azadomycin is also in. One is uh, SGN CD33A, which is called vatastuximab tallerine. It's kind of on hold right now from um, the FDA because of um, prolonged low blood counts that were seen in patients who received it. There's also a lot of interest in bispecific antibodies, which um, there's one that's approved for ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but it's not. Uh, not been an immediate uh, translation into success for patients with AML when um, a similar drug has been used that targets CD33. Uh, oral azacitidine um, has been studied. It's not yet approved, but it, it may also be beneficial as a low-intensity regimen. Um, azacitidine right now is given either subcutaneously or IV, so obviously it would be nice to have an option that's oral. And guadacitabine, which is a next generation um, hypomethylating agent, may also have a role as well. It's being studied in phase three clinical trials right now. So just um, very close to the end, I think some questions to ask your treating physician are, you know, are any of these newly approved drugs appropriate um, for my care? I think we um, at, in Seattle, as well as a lot of other people, are trying to figure out exactly how the newly approved drugs fit in. Um, I would also ask doctors about whether allotransplant is recommended. If so, when? Should it be in first complete remission? Should um, we wait and see if there's a chance of relapse and then pursue allotransplant at that point? Is there a role for maintenance therapy right now outside of patients with split 3 mutated AML who receive mitostorin and don't go on to a transplant? There's not really a role for maintenance therapy, but there may be more of one in the future. What clinical trials might I be eligible for? Some of those are treatment. At our center, we also have other clinical trials, for example, one that allows patients to receive induction as an outpatient and not have to be in the hospital. Another one that uses a telemonitoring device. So even if the treatment that you're receiving is standard drugs, is there a role for other um, clinical trials that might help you and also help researchers and future patients learn more about AML and successful ways to treat it. And then another question is, do you think I would benefit from a second opinion or where could I get a second opinion? Getting a diagnosis of AML is, is kind of a life-changing thing. There are a lot, of, um, a lot of things that go along with that and figuring out the treatment and where that should be um, and going to hear even if you're convinced that you're going to stay at one center, hearing from another um, treating physician can be very, very beneficial. So in conclusion, um, AML does have a high mortality rate, but it can be cured. And for many patients, we approach AML with the goal of curing them. That's sometimes not possible, um, even in patients that we attempt to cure it in. Uh, sometimes for patients, generally those who are much older and have adverse risk disease at the time of diagnosis, it's pretty um, unlikely that they will be cured. 
Risk stratification using a variety of factors is important for treatment decisions, primarily after induction in terms of whether patients will get chemotherapy alone or will go on to get an allogeneic transplant. These new drugs as well as allotransplant can increase our chance of being able to cure AML, but there's still a lot of research that remains to be done. So that's the end of my presentation, and I think Sue will now uh, moderate questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Personal. That was an excellent presentation. Um, and we do have several questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. The first one seems to, actually there are several here, about what the five-year survival rate for AML is, either with or without transplant. Can you address that question? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a little bit challenging to answer that because a lot of it depends on some of the particular characteristics of the leukemia, primarily the cytogenetic and molecular characteristics that help divide somebody into being good risk or intermediate risk or adverse risk. So the overall five-year survival rate, if you take everyone who is reported with a diagnosis of AML, uh, right now to the National Cancer Institute SEER registry is 26.9%. Um, but, you know, some subgroups like patients who have favorable risk AML, something like a translocation between chromosomes 8 and 21, which is sometimes called one of the core binding factor leukemias, those patients have a 70% chance of being cured at five years with just chemotherapy alone. So some people look at that as glass half full and say 70% chance of being cured, and others say 30% chance of relapsing um, or dying and, and generally from relapse and needing other treatments. But, um, but it's, it's very variable depending on the, the characteristics of the patient's leukemia. I think one other quick thing to add in response to that is that a lot of it, um, we can come up with our predictions pre-treatment as treating physicians, but a lot of it depends on the actual characteristics of a particular patient's leukemia. And so one of the most important things is to assess somebody's response after they have actually received treatment. So did they respond, you know, quote unquote, the way they should have, the way we would have expected them to? So they did have a great response or they, they didn't have a great response, and, and how do we move forward from there? Beth would like to know, uh, actually she said that her transplant was in 2014, and she wants to know whether her chances of relapse decrease over time and whether it depends on her age. She was under the impression that AML cannot be cured. The patient is either in remission or relapses. Can you clarify that? Yeah, so AML can be cured. Um, generally, for all cancers, we use five years as a point when we say that patients are cured if they've had no evidence of disease at that point. That's hard because it's, it's very rare but possible that patients can relapse later, but if, if patients make it to five years, the vast majority, greater than 95% of them, will be cured. Um, I guess the other part of the question was, do the chances of relapse decrease over time? And the answer to that question is definitely yes. So um, patients who are, who, we can talk first about patients who don't get a transplant, but, um, and then talk about patients who do. Patients who don't get a transplant, um, there was a study published from MD Anderson about a decade ago that looked at patients um, and if they get to three years after their initial remission, so generally those are patients who are treated with chemotherapy alone, then their chance of relapse decreases significantly. And that probably goes back to what I was saying before about acute leukemias being acute. So unlike um, solid organ cancers, which, you know, in some cases can be relatively slow growing and you know, you don't necessarily notice them. That's why you have these screening tests like mam mammography and colonoscopy and that kind of thing. Um, acute leukemias don't hide around generally. They kind of make themselves known. So if they haven't made themselves known by three years, then the likelihood is um, with chemotherapy alone that you've been cured. 
Similarly, um, for patients who have undergone an allo transplant, it's almost an accelerated timeline. So the chance of relapse is highest within the first year after the transplant, and that's a really important marker. If patients have made it past that one year mark, they're much less likely to relapse, but they are also much more likely to respond to chemotherapy again should it be needed in the future. So Cindy wants to know what happens if you relapse after an allo transplant? Are there any treatment options? Yes, and I, I didn't talk specifically about that situation, but yes, there are treatment options after allo transplant. Um, some of that can actually, uh, one possibility is actually getting a second allogeneic transplant. So sometimes that, that isn't possible. Um, it may not be realistic for a variety of reasons, but that would be a, an indication um, to consider a second transplant, possibly using a different donor source than before. Another possible treatment option is a donor lymphocyte infusion. Generally, that's considered if patients have been in a remission for a while after transplant, usually um, a year or more, and then they receive just lymphocytes from their donor. So sometimes those have been frozen at the time of the transplant, and so a frozen product can be used. Sometimes they need to be recollected from the donor again, but it's not like going through the whole transplant with the conditioning regimen and then the transplant um, again, it's an outpatient infusion of just the lymphocytes, and the idea is to kind of give a boost to the immune system and to get a graft versus leukemia effect active again. As we talked about, the counterpart anytime there's good graft versus leukemia is that there can be some graft versus host disease. So patients do need to be monitored in a transplant center for a flare of graft versus host disease. And then in terms of plain old chemotherapy without any cellular therapy like a donor lymphocyte infusion or a transplant, um, there are a lot of chemotherapies that can be used in patients who relapse after transplant. The goal, I think, of the chemotherapy needs to be really well defined before somebody embarks on chemotherapy. If they have relapsed relatively quickly, for example, after their transplant, less than six months after their transplant, I don't think it necessarily makes a lot of sense to give somebody intensive induction chemotherapy because we have to think about what that's going to bridge to. If it's an older patient who might not be a candidate for a second transplant, for example, then, then there really may not be um, it may not be a good risk-benefit uh, ratio to subject, subject somebody to intensive chemotherapy. On the other hand, um, in a young patient who you think you might be able to take to a second transplant intensive chemotherapy similar to what they received at the time of their diagnosis of AML may be appropriate. <clears throat> Donna asked, um, her mother is 66 years old, considering a transplant for AML and she would like you to discuss uh, quality of life issues after a transplant for AML and whether in someone of 66 years of age it's appropriate uh, to do a transplant or whether the quality of life will be poorer after transplant. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And if I had my crystal ball, I would bring it out in this situation, but I don't. Um, it's, it's very challenging. Um, you know, AML is generally considered harder to cure in older patients, and so we, we lean on transplant as being one of the adjuncts that we have to traditional chemotherapy. Um, I don't know exactly what kind of regimen um, they're considering for, for her mom, but, um, you know, it's, there are a lot of regimens that are relatively tolerable. It's very hard to predict whether somebody is going to have complications of graft-versus-host disease, which I would say is the major thing that affects long-term quality of life for patients. Sometimes there are short-term, big-time short-term issues that happen as well in terms of acute graft-versus-host disease and um, some very kind of nitty-gritty logistical things like potentially being quite far away from your family, 
um, isolated somewhere, getting, getting therapy if you don't live near a transplant center and have to travel someplace to go get one. But um, overall, um, you know, quality of life is very important, and that balance is different for every patient. So I think you have to go into the treatment decision making with um, your eyes wide open and, and know as much as you can about it. But for an otherwise healthy 66-year-old woman, generally, you know, relatively healthy before the diagnosis of the leukemia, that kind of thing, um, the transplant would probably make a lot of sense. There's, um, it's also important to say there is a lot of pre-transplant workup that's done for patients to make sure that they are going to be a good candidate for transplant. There's something called the HCTCI, the Hematopoietic Cell Transplantation Comorbidity Index, which can be calculated based on data that's gathered during the few weeks before patients um, are scheduled to undergo a transplant, so it takes into account the results of things like pulmonary function testing and that kind of thing that's not routinely done otherwise in terms of the care of patients with AML, uses that to help predict how patients are going to do post-transplant um, and are they likely to have a lot of complications from it. So, that, that, I think, is another way that we can try to use factors besides age to play into it. Tom would like to know if there's any progress being made with treatments for chronic GVHD. He's 10 years post-transplant for AML, uh, had an allogeneic stem cell transplant, and is still dealing with GVHD in his mouth. Yeah, that's um, not wasn't really within the, the scope of this, um, so I didn't spend any time really talking about that. The road of chronic GVH treatments has been checkered. Um, there have been a lot of things that seemed like they were going to be the latest and greatest. There is, um, There was actually a drug that was approved for chronic GVHD in 2017. It's a drug that's used, which is a big deal because there isn't anything else that actually carries that approval. Um, it's the drug ibrutinib, which is used for um, B cell lymphoid malignancies um, and, and is uh, a, what's called a BTK inhibitor. It's an oral medication. And so it's approved for a pretty specific um, clinical scenario for patients um, who, who are refractory to um, high-dose steroids. So that isn't um, really the, the same situation as Tom is dealing with because he sounds like he has isolated graft-versus-host disease um, effects in, in the mouth, which can certainly be very limiting and affect daily quality of life. So I think that with dealing with chronic GVHD, there's a lot of discussion about whether the treatment should be local, if it's something just in the mouth, or um, the side, dealing with some of the side effects of systemic therapies, whether that's something like steroids or some of the other immunosuppressants or this newer approved drug, ibrutinib. There are a lot of clinical trials looking at this, um, so that would be something that Tom could look into um, generally, again, for more systemic issues rather than local, uh, local ones, but it might be something that he could um, see if there's a center near him or the center where he got his transplant if they have any other treatment options. Um, I'm not sure I understand this question. Maybe Howard can clarify it or perhaps you understand it. If the genetics are unknown, what is the course of action if no presentation in blood or marrow? Is that clear to you? Uh, I will attempt to answer it, and then we can see if it was clear to if uh, <laughs> it's clear if it was clear to me or not. But um, so I think he might be speaking about um, a situation that happens about less than five percent of the time when um, there are blasts whether in the blood or the bone marrow, but for some reason the cytogenetics, he says no sample of the tumor was kept. Well, okay, well, I'll answer what I was going to say first and then we can see. Um, so the, sometimes we are in the clinical situation where we send the sample to the lab for testing and to get the cytogenetics, which is the chromosome studies, um, you actually, the, in the lab, the cells from the, 
leukemia blasts need to be grown in culture, and then they need to um, uh, treat them and then look at them to identify the, the chromosome testing, for example. So sometimes they, they aren't able to actually culture or grow the cells up, and so they'll say that the cytogenetics failed and that they weren't able to determine whether there were any abnormalities or not. Um, oh, he's saying no sample of the tumor was kept for a myeloid sarcoma. Yeah, so that's a little bit more of a challenging situation. Myeloid sarcomas are those solid masses of leukemia cells, and sometimes that um, can be the presentation. In general, um, if the genetics are unknown, um, most times uh, myeloid sarcoma is of intermediate um, risk, and so often patients would be recommended to undergo um, a transplant. So it's very challenging when the cytogenetics aren't known because sometimes it can be, uh, a myeloid sarcoma can be a manifestation of favorable risk leukemia. Um, but one factor to take into account is uh, the, the patient Howard's age because um, generally for the treatment of, um, of patients with myeloid sarcoma, transplant um, alone is not always as effective allogeneic transplant as it is for other subtypes because um, the, the cells have managed the leukemia cells have managed to escape the blood um, and marrow compartment and go out into solid um, tissues. And so um, the transplanted cells from the donor may not be able to, to migrate to those tissues um, as well. And so sometimes we still consider transplants in patients who have evidence or have had evidence of myeloid sarcoma, but often we recommend that they get, for example, um, total body irradiation. Um, which would be a more intensive um, regimen, um, but it's, and he says that his, it's a 23-year-old in this case, so it's a very, very challenging clinical situation. I'm not sure there's a right answer, but I think that probably erring on the side of um, transplant would make sense, but this is something that probably requires um, a multidisciplinary discussion of the, the treatment options and at the least a transplant consult somewhere. All right, and one question that we get quite frequently and maybe you can elaborate on this is, why is it so important to have a family caregiver available to take care of the patient for uh, an extended period of time after the transplant? Yeah. So I talked briefly about some of the complications that can happen with transplant. Um, I'll just flip to that slide again. So issues with infections and graft-versus-host disease can be a huge problem in the first 100 days after transplant, which is generally the time when a caregiver is, is required um, by most transplant centers to be with the patient 24 hours a day. Um, and most transplant centers have a radius um, that they expect that the patients will live uh, within while they are in this kind of peri-transplant period. And, um, you know, the patients, I think, who've been through the rest of AML treatment kind of, you know, feel like, I got this. But um, it's really a different situation to undergo transplant. The complications are different. The side effects of the medicines are different, particularly for Patients who undergo myeloablative transplants, the mucositis is, can be so different and so debilitating compared to what it's like with standard AML chemotherapy that it really is important um, to be able to have somebody to communicate with them um, and for them on their behalf who's a very close family member or a close friend who can help them through this time. Um, I think also as we do transplants in older patients, some of the non-myeloablative transplants, a lot of it is done outpatient. And so, you know, you really need somebody who's going to be able to take care of you when you're not in the clinic, take you back and forth to the clinic or the infusion center, really be able to monitor you in a way that you aren't able to monitor yourself when, when you're not feeling up to your best. You will, again, I mean, that's the goal of getting through transplant, 
but some of these complications really um, need, need attention as soon as they develop, and having somebody else to be able to count on and, and help you is really important. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Percival. That was an excellent presentation. Um, and I know we've learned a lot from the questions and answers. I want to once again thank Dr. Percival and also Estellas, who generously supported this webinar, and wish everyone a good night.